So let's talk about ecological sampling. This video is probably going to be a little bit longer, but it's because we've got quite a few syllabus objectives to cover. First of all, what is ecological sampling? Well, sampling is when we take a small selection or sample or measure a small selection of an ecosystem to represent the whole ecosystem. There's no way we could count everything in the ecosystem. So we select a small selection of it that is meant to be representative of the whole ecosystem. There's lots of things that we can measure. We can use it to work out the or estimate the population to determine the distribution or spread and the location of the species and the abundance of the species to calculate biodiversity, to investigate environmental gradients, to see how the abiotic and biotic factors change across a geographical area. Um, and also to, and, and that, that's linked to zonation. Uh, and then also we're gonna have a look at how the ecosystem is stratified. So there's some new words here that I'll just introduce to you. So the idea of a gradient is obviously a, a, a change or a slope. Uh, another way to look at that is zonation. So the idea here is that, so this is a picture here of uh, an intertidal zone. So um, going from the high tide mark all the way down to the low tide. And, and so because the abiotic factors change across that time, the length of time out of the water, the biotic factors or the organisms that live there also change. So looking at zonation or, or investigating environmental gradient means that we're able to look at the zonation, look at how the organism abundance and distribution changes with changing abiotic factors across a gradient. We can also look at profiles. This is like a horizontal um, representation of the ecosystem where we do a drawing of the, the, um, the plant species. And stratification, we're going to look at a lot of stratification, but that basically means the different layers. So I'm going to introduce you to two things, sampling strategies and sampling techniques. The sampling strategies are guess, the overall program, the overall way in which we're going to do our sampling. And the techniques are the actual ways in which we're going to use to measure. So firstly, with the sampling strategies, it really depends on what the ecosystem's like. So you need to understand the ecosystem first. And you'll recognize this diagram from a previous uh, video when we looked at the, um, the distribution in an ecosystem. When we have a uniform distribution, well, we can use random sampling. Now, random doesn't just mean going and measuring whatever you like. It still has um, a, a good system behind it, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But we can only really do it when we have a uniform distribution. So the species uh, or the organisms are distributed kind of evenly. Now, if we have a transition or a zonation, like a gradient, then we might we would use a systematic sampling strategy where we might, uh, in every five meters or something along the gradient, we're going to take our measurements. Now, most ecosystems aren't either of those, they're more heterogeneous. You know, they've got clumping distribution or random distribution. And for that reason, we need to do what's called stratified sampling. And we do that to ensure that we represent each of the clumped areas uh, equally, or proportionally, I should say. So let's have a look at each of these. So firstly, random sampling. As I mean, it's, it's not just totally random. To, to minimize bias, what we do is we, uh, across the ecosystem, we establish a grid and we number that grid. And then we use a random number generator to determine which of these um, sections of the grid we're going to sample. The random number generator removes bias. So there's 25 squares here. And there's one, two, three, four, five, there's six that have, will be sampled. That's around about a quarter. So as you can see, it's, it's, it's not the whole ecosystem that's being sampled because it would just simply take too long. So this is a, a sample of the ecosystem using um, a random number generator removes the bias of the, um, 
the sections that are selected for counting. Uh, random sampling is very efficient. Trouble though is that if we have clumped and rare species, well they may well be missed. Now systematic sampling, this is like when we've got a gradient and it, it's, it's got to be a very structured and it's determined ahead of time with predetermined intervals. But where for example it might be every five meters along this transect line we're going to put down our quadrat and we're going to measure uh, we'll collect our data at that point. Um, again, it's quite efficient, uh, minimizing bias, but again, clumped and rare species may be missed. So here's an example of how we might do systematic sampling. So in every, this again, it's predetermined. Every three quadrats, in every third quadrat, we're going to do, okay, predetermined ahead of time removes the bias. Now with stratified sampling, this is the one that the syllabus really wants you to focus on. Stratified sampling is a, a method of sampling that ensures all different areas are represented and sampled proportionally. So if you have a look at this ecosystem here, it's heterogeneous. We've got four different plant species plus this grass species and we've got uh, a creek running through it. Now we would need to ensure that we have a sampling strategy that ensures each of these plant species are sampled proportionally. So to do that, first of all, we identify all the different areas. Now these areas we call strata. Okay, so this would be a strata, 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 strata. Sometimes the strata are different levels, uh, different heights of the ecosystem. Um, it, it really depends, but we need to understand the ecosystem first. We need to identify the different strata. Then we need to work out how much of the ecosystem each strata occupies. What's the proportion for each strata? And then we use a process to sample that proportionally. And that process is called sampling fraction. So I've just changed this a little bit to increase the area occupied by this particular species. And now we can see out of 25 squares, one, two, three, four, five of the squares are occupied by this species. So five divided by 25 is 20%. So that means that we would need to ensure that 20% of all of the squares that we sample need to come from either four, five, eight, nine, or 10. So if we're sampling two squares, that means two of those squares must come from the ones with this species. So we would put four, five, eight, nine, ten into a random number generator, and the first two that came up would be the two that we would do that contain this species. And there'd be one for this species, one for this species, one for this species, one for the grass. That would be how we would do a sampling fraction. So that were the sampling strategies. Now we have sampling techniques, the quadrant, the transect, and also mark and recapture. So a quadrat is basically it's a square uh, of a set size, and it's used to sample the ecosystem, sample what's inside the quadrat. Now the quadrat size is going to vary depending on your ecosystem. So if you're doing a rocky shore ecosystem, one by one meter would be perfect. But if you're doing a dry sclerophyll forest, you want to use a 10 by 10 meter quadrat or something similar, maybe five by five or something. But it needs to be a set size. We can use it to measure abundance. So how many organisms? And of course, percentage cover, we can estimate. Um, and also percentage frequency, you know, is it present or is it not present? It's ideal for sessile organisms. Sessile means organisms that don't move. The transect is a line, and it's ideally used along a gradient uh, in which to study the change in distribution of species. So we might run it from the high tide mark to the low tide mark, or um, uh, down a slope towards a creek. And we can use it to measure the change in distribution and change in abiotic factors. Again, it's ideal for sessile organisms. So we have a single line, which we call a line transect, 
With a line transect, we just count the organisms that are in contact with the line. Then we have a belt transect. So basically, we have two lines of a fixed known distance between them, maybe a metre between them, maybe five metres between them, depending on the ecosystem. And we count or measure everything that's inside those two lines, so inside the belt. So you can imagine the belt transect is going to, you can have much, much more data, but it's going to take much longer. And then we can have an interrupted belt. So we've got a transect line, and then we do quadrats. So at a, um, a predetermined distance, maybe every five meters, every, um, every 10 meters, we put our quadrat down and we sample what's inside that along the transect line. Again, th well, this one here, we, it's kind of like the, um, a compromise between the two. If you're just putting down random quadrats, so this could again still be you know done using a random number generator, not just throwing them out there. But even still, if you're just doing random quadrats, you can only measure abundance and not distribution. You can't measure distribution because you haven't looked at the whole ecosystem. A line transect, just a single line, we can measure distribution, but not abundance. We don't know how many, because we're only counting the ones that are touching the line. A good compromise here is the belt transect. We can look at both the distribution and abundance of organisms. Now, another technique is called the mark and recapture. This is what we use for motile organisms. Motile means moving. So we'll have a look at that one in just a second. So your overall sampling strategy is going to depend on your ecosystem and it's going to depend on the purpose of your sampling program. But you can use your sampling strategy can your sampling strategy can use one or more sampling techniques. So like for example, we might do random sampling with quadrats. We might do systematic interrupted belt transects. So this is systematic sampling and we use belt transects. Note that I've got two transect lines here. The more data, the better. Um, now with stratified sampling, again, we might use quadrats, but we're placing them differently according to our sampling fraction. So let's have a look at mark and recapture. It's a way of estimating the population of motile organisms. It really is an estimate because it's, it's, it's a bit loose. It's not a great estimate, but you know, it's, it's really the, probably the best you can do. We use Lincoln's index as our method or our formula for calculating. Essentially what we do is we go out and capture motile organisms of a particular species. We count how many we've caught and we mark them in some way. Then we release them. At some stage in the future, we can come back and collect species again, that collect organisms again. And we're gonna count how many we've caught the second time, but how many of those that we've caught the second time have we've caught before, you know, are already marked. Okay, so the capital M is the number originally marked. I've just changed that to the number originally caught, because that seems to make more sense. So capital M is the number that was originally caught, Lowercase n is the total number caught in the second time, or the second sample. And lowercase m is the number of marked individuals in the second sample. Okay, we put that data into uh, this formula, and we get n, capital N, which is the estimated population. So here's an example then. A researcher estimates the number of trout in a lake. She, captures, <laughs> she captured and marked 109 trout in the first sample. So that would be capital N. A few days later, she caught 177. That would be lowercase n, of which 57 were marked. That's the lowercase m. So we put those into Lincoln's index, and we get an estimated population of 338. So that's the easy part. The, the calculation is the easy part. But um, obviously, the more difficult part is doing the capturing and Mar uh, and marking um, there's some issues of course with it so um, 
biases could come from um, trap shyness. So in other words, organisms are, are shy to, uh, to be caught. You know, they avoid getting caught. It might be that um, after being caught the first time, they become shy. Um, it might be that when you mark them, it slows them down, it injures them, it makes them a target for predation. It might rub off. So many different things that could be challenges with mark and recapture. Okay, now bias is a real big issue with sampling because we're not sampling the whole thing. So we need to try and design, collect and analyze our data in a way that doesn't favor one outcome or answer rather than the other. So a classic example would be you're doing random sampling. You've got your quadrat and you walk down to your ecosystem and you think this looks like an interesting spot and putting the quadrat down there. Or rather thinking, oh, there's too much to count there. I'm going to put it down here because I'm lazy. Well, that's a bias because you're favoring one outcome or another. So to minimize this, you need to have a large sample size, as large as you can. Use, uh, be really strategic about how you, and predetermine where you're going to uh, put your transect lines and your quadrats. Um, use random number generators. Have a criteria for counting. Um, ensure that the equipment that you're using is calibrated and that the equipment are aware of the precision, the limit of precision of your equipment as well. Because of course, what I haven't really talked about here is that we would use this same sampling strategy to collect abiotic data as well. Now, that um, we would probably, depending on the, the strategy or depending on your research question, the purpose for the sampling, you're probably collecting data about the, the organisms and the abiotic factors at each of the spots in which you're sampling. And when you do abiotic factors, you do it, if you're doing quadrats, you do it, you collect your data in the middle of the quadrat. So designing a sampling program is going to depend on a lot of things. First of all, how much time, money, and how many, how much personnel have you actually got to collect your data? That's why we sample because there's never a limited an unlimited amount of time, etc. So what resources have you actually got? Safety and access is super important of, as, as well, of course. Your, your actual sampling program is going to depend on what your research question is. What's the purpose of your sampling? You need to ensure that what your, your sampling program and the design of it, your selection of the sites that you use is representative of the ecosystem. You need to be able to justify that. You need to design it to minimize bias don't forget that the ecosystem might be different at different times of the day and during different seasons. So if your resources permit and your purpose and research question require, you might need to come back at different times of the day and different seasons. You might need to continue to sample for several years. Um, so the duration or, or the, the number of times in which your sampling program the number of times in which you sample throughout your sampling program. The way that you present your data and you analyze your data, or you analyze your data and present your data, is going to depend on the purpose of your sampling and your research question. But you're generally going to have data tables with processed data, so like your means, your standard deviations, uh, and you're going to graph that data in a meaningful way. And you're also probably going to do some statistical analysis. So, um, you know, some sort of way of determining whether the difference that you observe is statistically significant or whether there's a relationship between the abiotic and the biotic factors, for example. Now, these will be measured in your student experiment. Much of this will be measured in your student experiment. Some of it also in the research, uh, in the external exam. There's always a question on the external exam about stratified sampling.